Welcome to Bayesian Statistics. We're going to go into JAGS this time, and JAGS stands for Just Another Gib Sampler. So I'm going to quickly review what we said was a Gib Sampler before, and this is the very simplistic version. Uh, there's a lot more detailed versions of this, but this is the simplest one. Pick starting values. This is going to be where we start sampling from. And what we do is we just alternate sampling between the two using their conditional distributions. Uh, so that requires us to need the full conditionals in order to do this. Uh, once I've pulled the two samples, the two together form a sample from the joint. And we do this again and again and again. And we create a chain of samples uh, of size M from our posterior distribution. Uh, this is basically the idea of Gibbs sampling. This is what JAGS is doing, sort of. But in order to do this, we need to know all the full conditionals and we need to work them out. And the nice thing about JAGS is, is it will take care of that for us. However, we need to learn how to interact with JAGS in order to make this happen. And we're going to work on using R to interact with JAGS using a package called R2 JAGS. So if you don't have JAGS, go download JAGS. Um, you know, just put in JAGS, uh, um, let's see here, Gibbs sampler into Google. It'll take you to some place. You can download it. I think it's on SourceForge. Uh, download that, go to R, load the package, uh, R Jags and R2 Jags. All right, so we're going to look at the normal distribution again. We looked at it last time because I showed you exactly how a Gibbs sampler works from programming standpoint in R, but now we're going to let Jags do the work. Okay, and so we're going to look at the syntax differently. All right, so Noof is interested in the weight of blue crabs in the Chesapeake Bay. So there's these crabs, and they're quite blue, and they live in the Chesapeake Bay. She believes that most blue crabs are 150 kilograms, or 150 grams, plus or minus 15 grams. Okay, uh, so that would give us a prior distribution from you of 150.15. Uh, and here we're going to have sigma naught squared is 15 squared. So here is our prior distribution, our likelihood that's going to come from a normal distribution with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared. Um, we can't use the conjugate prior that we would like to because JAGS doesn't have an inverse chi-squared, so we're going to have to kind of just do something different. And in this case, we're going to use a sigma squared follows a gamma 1-1, one, one, and this isn't an unreasonable thought in the sense that uh, sigma squared has to be positive, right? Gamma's positive, so it's not the worst choice in the world. Okay, so here we go. We've got our pieces here. We've got our two prior distributions, one for mu, one for sigma squared. Here's our likelihood, and we're just going to write this into JAGS, and we've got a model statement here. And remember, we're going to be typing this into R, so don't type it into JAGS, okay? So we're going to define a model, and we are going to put it in quotes, okay? So it's going to be in quotes, and if you copy and paste this over, it probably won't work. You have to reset the quotes. Uh, just because it uses different characters. Um, but anyway, uh, so here we're going to have a loop for i in 1 to n1, and n1 is going to be the same as n here. Okay, so we're just going to go across all of these. We're going to have a likelihood here, x1i. Well, I have xi here, so you can see where that comes from. It comes from, and it uses this twiddle, just like here, uh, d norm, which is the normal piece here. Mu1 is its mean, sig1 is its variance, and, but it's not actually its variance. Uh, it's actually precision, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so JAGS uses precision versus using variance, and precision is 1 over the variance. Okay, so we're going to have to have a prior distribution. So mu follows d norm 150, uh, 1 over 15 squared in order to get that to work out. Okay, it's not 15 squared, it's 1 over 15 squared. And then here I've got sig1 is equal to d gamma 1, 1. So that's our model statement here. So we have to make sure we get it right. Take a moment, maybe pause the video to make sure you type this incorrectly. Uh, because then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to write it out to a file. Okay, 
So I just compacted all this down. This is the same code as last time. But we're going to write lines, this mod1, to mod1.jags. Whatever your working directory is is where this is going to go. Now, this is the name of your model on the machine, and you're going to have to remember that because Jags is going to want to know where that is. All right, so now we can prepare the data to put it into the model. So we've got a model. We've written it out. It's sitting in our working directory. Okay, so she goes out and collects some data. Here's the data she collected. And what we want to do is calculate things from it. So I'm going to put this data into a X1. And I'm using X1 because it's the same as the X1 here. Things should match up. Otherwise, things can get ugly. So X1, I plugged in all the numbers here. That makes it into a vector. All right, so the next thing we need to do is find out how many of them there are. So we're going to have N1, and I chose N1 because I'm going to scroll back to the code. We've got N1 here, okay? So that's how many X's there are. And that's what this says. What's the length of that, okay? Then we're going to put the data together in a list. So the data is going to be equal to a list, quotes X1, comma, quotes N1. So it knows which ones of these to hand off to JAGS. Then the next thing we need to do is define the parameters we want to export at the end. Basically, the ones we want to keep track of. Uh, and you would say, why wouldn't you want to keep track of all of them? Well, when you get hundreds of parameters, maybe you don't want to keep track of all of them. Maybe you just want to keep track of uh, mu and sigma 1. All right, and then, like we mentioned with the Gib sampler, we need the starting values, okay? So here I've got mu is 120, sigma is 1, okay? So this is what we have here. Uh, and I just chose them. Uh, they seem to be reasonable numbers. Uh, so we have all the pieces to run the model, okay? So now this is how we run the model here. So we're going to run the JAGS model, model1.jags, and here we're going to use the JAGS function, Data is our data that we put together. In its one is our initial values we put together. Parameters to save is param ones. Those were the parameters we said to save off. And iterations is how long do I want it to sample. I'm going to have it sample a thousand times. And the number of chains I want to use. So basically, how many times do I want to do this? Do I want to go back and start over and come back at it? And then it says the last one is the model.file. And this is mod one jags and this is the one that's in quotes and this is the one that sits in your working directory so if it's not in your working directory this needs to point wherever that file is okay so here we're getting the number of samples we're going to pull and is the number of chains uh, that we're going to use for this all right then once i've run this it will run everything and then i can update it again if i want to get more samples and that's what i'm going to try to do is i'm going to try to get five thousand more samples that way i don't have to worry about the first thousand here all right the next thing i want to do is pull them back into r so mod one samps is as dot mcmc mod one dot jags two so this is going to go out and take and peel the samples off of our JAGS object. Okay, then we're going to want to look at trace plots. And a trace plot is basically the samples through time. And they should look like fuzzy caterpillars. This one does not look bad at all. This one does not look bad at all. This one looks pretty good. Okay, what I mean by fuzzy caterpillars, they should be flat, but they should be fuzzy and they shouldn't wander up or wander down. And I'll show you some bad ones here in a second. All right, so this is a good trace plot. Um, fuzzy caterpillar, it's probably pretty good. Uh, this is a bad trace plot. Notice it just keeps wandering and wandering and wandering. So this means it's not converged to a region of high probability. So once it reaches a region of high probability, it should start looking like a fuzzy caterpillar. Uh, here's another bad trace plot. So this one is a bunch of stair steps, and this is what we would call a sticky chain. Um, so this means that... The sampler is having a rough time finding new values to plug in. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for that, but just know that this is not good. All right, now that I've ran everything, I'm going to peel the samples off. Chain 1, chain 2. Remember, I did two chains. Uh, so I'm going to do mod 1 samps uh, bracket bracket 1 and mod 1 samps bracket bracket 2. Okay. And then I'm going to stack them on top of each other so that all the data is in one long chain under the name chains1. 
uh, then from this, I can actually just get the quantiles that I wanted to get out of this. Okay, so here are my quantiles for my uh, posterior credible interval, and I can get a posterior credible interval on sigma 1, but remember this is precision, so I'd need to do 1 over that to get it to be something useful. Uh, we can use the plot density, chains 1, comma 2, type equals L, and you can see you get this nice picture here of what the uh, posterior looks like for the first one and for the second one. Uh, notice that this one's way more symmetric and this one's more right skewed, just like we would expect means and variances to be. All right, and then if we did one over the density, this is what we get here, which is more like what we would be after. All right, so and then I can take the square root of that, then it becomes more like a standard deviation and allows us to look, think about things that way. All right, so now we've played with uh, JAGs a bit, and everything else we're going to do from here on out, we're going to keep using JAGs. Uh, why? Because it'll handle a lot of this for us. Now, you'll just have to uh, hang on here, and we'll do lots of other examples, and you'll learn how to use JAGs at least at a beginner's level, and that's for most people enough. All right, so we're going to talk about how to use this information again to do like a two-sample t-test in the next video. So I will see you there.